Hey everybody. Hey everyone, hope you're well. Hope you had a chance to see the uh, latest version, latest episode of Hard Knocks Training Camp with the Oakland Raiders on HBO. Uh, it was great programming, great show. Yeah, I, you know, people say, well, they're only showing you what the team wants you to see and everything else. And, uh, but I think, you know, having said that, the Raiders uh, do a good job of uh, giving the fan and as much of an unvarnished view as possible. Um, and uh, I, I, I quite enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it was really well done, you know? It was very, really very well done. And um, I have to say that uh, on top of everything else, what I particularly enjoy is that uh, I, I enjoy that you get a chance to look at people. You can say, I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. And also for a lot of you uh, who are locals, it's like Keelan Doss. Hey, you know what? I know that guy, right? And um, that, that that guy I used to hang out with in Alameda. Or I used to do this and uh, with him and everything else. And now he's uh, an Oakland Raider, right? And uh, that's that's a cool thing, you know? That, that's a cool place to be, to be able to say, I know that guy, you know, and uh, I hope he makes the team. That's that's the whole point about this that's really kind of sad is that you, look, it's, it's a zero-sum game. Someone wins and someone loses, okay, uh, in the, at this stage of the game in the NFL. And, well, actually, at every stage of the game in the NFL, if you think about it, okay, and, uh, uh, but you... You always want to see the, the local. Uh, hey, Sean Watson, how you doing? You want to see, you always want to see the, the hometown guy or gal make it, make it big, you know? And that's certainly true for Keelan Doss. Thoughts on what I saw? Um, there's some humor that, uh, you, 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 know, you can tell this thing has a media perspective, right? Because what they show you is the sensational stuff. Like for example, uh, you will see, uh, you'll see, uh, fights, right? Oh, there was this fight, you know? Oh, there was this fight, okay? Oh, and there was this fight. And, um, uh, and I'm thinking, forget the fight. Show me the play that was just ran there because it was one of those, uh, read option style runs that were popularized by Chip Kelly, all right? And the more I see of the Raider offense, I'm writing here, Raider, Raiders offense is real story. Uh, and I'm saying not the fight at training camp. And I'm writing this at King camp versus the Rams, but comma, but the use of read option comma chip kelly kelly style runs and 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 uh uh looks and action and look and play action and play action is what i'll call it although play action would to some imply something else right but what what i recall and I'm not going to be on this one long. Last time I was on until two, but I don't really have that kind of time this time. Uh, I, but the last time, the last time I pointed to this was 2015, and I went to cover the Raiders preseason game against the uh, Arizona Cardinals, specifically because I was interested in what then. Offensive coordinator Bill Musgrave was experimenting. He was actually putting elements of Chip Kelly's offense into the Raider offense. But really, if you look closer at that game, and I believe I still have video from that, um, what they were really doing was, was putting in elements from read option spread offense systems, particularly those that were popularized in terms of action by then Cal offensive coordinator. Uh, uh, coordinator 
under Sonny, uh, Sonny Dykes, and, uh, who uh, really, I think, um, just in a very quiet way, in a very, uh, a very quiet way, all right, a very quiet way, slowly, slowly revolutionized uh, football. And um, Tony Franklin, if you've never heard the name, you should get to know Tony Franklin because Derek, excuse me, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 the early success of Cal under Sonny Dykes and with Jared Goff was strictly a story with Tony Franklin. And Tony and Sonny had some kind of falling out causing Cal to switch offensive coordinators and they never regained the record-setting mojo they enjoyed under Tony Franklin. That's just a fact. The, the cover story was, hey, you know what? Um, he's got to go back, uh, be closer to his family, Eastern Kentucky. And I believe that. You know, I'm not saying I don't believe that because at the end of the day, that's what tur it turned out, right? But there were mumbling things that they didn't quite get along. And that's really too bad because had they stayed together, I believe they would have eventually got Cal to constant balls and uh, they were certainly exciting to watch and they had a they had the number one guy in the draft okay and that was Jared Goff right so um, so so I say all that because what I believe the Raiders are doing now is going back to that and installing elements of it because 2015 and 2016 in particular were the worst the most not the, the there's no Freudian slip there, were the most successful years uh, of the Raider offense in some time. That's just the, the books show that, all right? But also, it's now style in the NFL to use that. You know what I mean? It's stylish. It's style. Now, um, I'll get to your comments regarding Hard Knocks. I don't know how many of you had a chance to see it uh, again. And... Um, uh, Sean Watson says that he knows, you know, you know, Keelan Doss. Tell us about Keelan. What, what do you know? What do you know about Mr. Doss? Um, Sean, we'd lo love to hear what your, your comments on, on that. And while you're typing something, I'll say that one item of some coaches approach that I dislike is when a quarterback in particular makes a mistake and they yell at the quarterback and say, what were you doing? It, to me, a coach, if they're calling the plays, and maybe John wasn't calling the plays, but if you're calling the play and you know how the play is designed, then, and you, you know what you're looking at, then you can have some idea yourself of what the quarterback was trying to do. And the question is, was he going for the right receiver? Well, Peterman said he was going for a single, single high. At single high, he was going for single coverage. But what happened was he simply threw the ball late. And what you have to ask yourself, you have to be an analyst and say, hey, look, um, what happened there? And was it a footwork issue? You know, just go through the checklist of things that he does rather than this yelling like, what are you doing? I don't like that myself. I think that a coach on the field should be a constant teacher and not a yeller. That's me, okay? And I don't think you get any, I don't believe you get anything out of yelling at people in this day and age. That did work years ago. I was thinking about that as I was watching Hard Knocks. I remember, um, because the environment tends to be this way. It's like, well, okay, Zinni, did you ever play football? And my reaction was, yeah, I did. When? Well, I went out for football on Skyline. Did you make it? Well, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? I was, uh, manager equipment manager what so yeah well how did that happen okay well i'll tell you um i went out to be quarterback but i really was doing it to get my own plays in and then i had and then defense and spring practice they put me in a strong safety and then the way skyline high school in oakland ran their defense uh three four by the way um the strong safety had an assignment where if it was split backs and the tight end is here and the strong safety is here if the back came out of the backfield, my assignment was to cover 
the back coming out of the backfield. Otherwise, I was to stay here, okay? And the linebacker, strong side, had the tight end. I know it seemed like a little screwy because you would think maybe the, the strong side linebacker should take the back, but they were having a strong side linebacker actually chuck the, the tight end, which I understand. So if the back came out, what I was doing was going with him. Otherwise, I was coming out and essentially double acting. So what I did was this. Instead of when the back came out, instead of going straight for the back to cover him, the flanker was coming out and the flanker was going to run an out pattern. What I did was I went this way and I was trying to bait the quarterback into going for the back. Because in those days, the idea of checking down was unheard of. This was 1978, okay? Um, Bill Walsh had not come to a point where his systems were popularized, where you throw that kind of what they call check down or, or flat. And um, so I basically went high as if I was going to double cover the flanker. And I could hear Tony Fardella, the coach of Skyline at the time, yell, What are you doing? Abraham! I mean, boy, he turned three shades of red. Yeah, I said red. He turned three shades of red. What are you doing? And when I went back, I had a solid explanation why I did what I did. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was nothing he could say because he knew it was a good idea. Um, in fact, I have what, what, what happened was I wound up getting four of my plays in, including a very unique kind of double reverse pitch pass, which went for 36 yards and a touchdown against Fremont High, Fremont High School. If you went watching this and you went to Fremont High, hey, Skyline was better. Anyway, um, <laughs> so my point is that um, I always believe that you should have a pointillist, a pointillist, uh, a, a very much a pointillist um, view, view or way of um, approaching the game and an intelligent way of approaching the game rather than yelling, okay? Uh, and, so, and so what happens is that if you come off yelling, in this day and age, players don't know a lot. In those days... Players were afraid of Fardella. They were afraid of hearing his voice. They were afraid of what he might say. But today, today, players, instead of being afraid that you're going to yell, some of them might fight you, okay, in front of everybody, thinking, you know, you're going to challenge my handhood because you have players, particularly in college and going to the NFL, even in high school, you have players who come from, in some cases, tough neighborhoods, and you know, they're probably are dealing with people pointing guns at them or have guns themselves. And so they have a mentality like, especially if the person is is white, talking to a, a guy and yelling at him like that, you, know, you can't yell at me, you blankety blank. So you so what happens is that instead of you teaching the player something, it becomes this sort of mono and mono thing that really has no business in football at that level where the coach is supposed to be the teacher. But if you're trying to assert yourself to a player, today, all is lost. Okay, the player comes in and already knows that you are the head coach and, or the assistant. They got that. Also, a lot of people forget this. The player wants to make the team. So any sane player is not going to step out of bounds and upset the coach and not perform within the repertoire that's set up for the player, right? So... If you take all that into consideration, then it becomes obvious that yelling is not so necessary. Teaching is better. And so when I hear John yell, my first thought is, okay, like with Glennon. What are you doing? Right? Oh, nice play. Okay. Instead of yelling, or even if he's praising him, talk about how he could have done better with the play. You know, think it through. Or maybe that was, hey, if that's the wrong play for them to call... Admit it. I mean, I noticed he got after Nathan Peterson for calling a run play into the strong safety, okay? Now, there are times when you actually want to do that. Why? Because you're setting up for another play, okay? In football, there are not absolutes. 
in life, they're not absolutes. You don't always do everything the same way all the time. Sometimes there is a logical reason to call a run and have that person run in that direction toward the strength because you might very well be setting up a play. You might want to have a, have a situation where you're setting, okay, let's say you're going, I left, okay? Um, and you want to set up play action, fake, um, I left, play action, split in post, which means I left is over here from my perspective. Split in is running a post. If you're coming play action like a sprint draw, like the Seattle Seahawks used to run with Jim Zorn in the late 70s, all right? They did that beautifully. You design that, sp that sprint draw, have him like he's fake to the halfback and the fullback come out just a, a, a yard behind where the tight end lines up about seven yards back, seven, six, six and a half to seven and a half yards back, all right? Play action fake, boom, 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 one, two, three steps, stop. Have the split and run, fake the corner, and then come back to the post. Uh, Giants won against the Athletics, 3-2. Um, Battle of the Bay. Touchdown, okay? So my point is there are reasons why you wouldn't want to call a strong side run like that where the safety is up close rather than running away from the safety. Because, hey, you're trying to set the defense up so that the safety is close and the free safety on the other side is cheating over to the strong side. Because, hey, just because they're over there doesn't mean you're not going to gain yards. Let's say they're over there and you do gain yards. Well, that gives them an incentive. They're not going to back off. They're going to just tighten up on the strong side. Great. Let them do that. They tighten up on the strong side. They're having a... a a problem stopping you from no gain, you're getting three and four yards, set them up for the big shot, okay? That's what I'm talking about. So that example right there explains why it's not a good idea for coaches, hey, fuck, man, now you done it, man. What are you doing, man? You know, because it becomes noise. And what happens is that you have the player doing with Mike Glennon, and Nathan Peterman did. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because they're, it's not so much. I mean, they do respect him, sure. But they're also just basically just saying, yeah, I got it, sir. You don't have to yell at me. Okay? <laughs> That's what basically they're saying. Even if they didn't get it, they don't want to be yelled at. No one wants to be yelled at. It, it takes a special person to say, I want you to yell at me in front of everybody. I, I don't know a lot of people like that. I, I know some. But I don't know a lot of people like that, okay? And so I don't think it's a good idea for John to keep that up because, you know, if you don't have a, a technical explanation why somebody did something wrong, after a while, that yelling is going to become, you know, it's going to sound like wah, 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 and that's not going to help the Raiders. So, you know, I don't, it's, it's not, it wasn't a good situation. It wasn't a good look for John. On the other hand, a good look for the team was the humor of Richie Incognito because there was a segment where Incognito, they had this fight, okay? And uh, Incognito was like, well, are you involved? And he goes, no, that's just pushing. One thing I've learned in this league is, you know, you don't do all that pushing, right? And uh, <laughs> it was quite funny. Uh, and so Incognito says, uh, you know, one thing I've learned in counseling is how to count to 10. And whoever he was talking to said, yeah, I was going to get to that at some point. In other words, <laughs> in other words, hey, how's counseling working for you? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's funny, fun stuff, funny stuff. Uh, I think, you know, I, I pray for Richie Incognito's success because the Lord has done him, a, given him, done him a solid in giving him this great chance. He's got a two-game suspension. Um, he's got a lot of experience. There's no question but that he's going to make the team. Um, and uh, I think the offense is going to be in good hands when he's able to get in there. My concern, I mean, my concern is is less with what I, is less uh, than what I saw the week before because I've seen this new team and it is a, a brand new team, okay? 
on the field. I mean, it is a brand new team. It is better uh, by some length than the previous Raiders version. The question is how, and I've said this before and I'll say this again, the question is how they adjust under fire, okay? And how well those plays work under when they're done. Hey, John, how you doing? Great to have you here. What did you think of Hard Knocks? Did you have a chance to see it? So, um, at any rate, uh, it, I come away with a good feeling about the organization, and uh, um, I can't wait to see what he does with Antonio Brown. I still think that John needs to just emphasize the positive about him. He's done a great... Great, 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 great pivot in terms of saying, hey, you know what? We're on this man's side. He's going to be here. We can't wait to get him in here. I've got great plays for him. Fine. Okay. Great stuff. Um, My only concern again is, hey, you know what? Oh, Dunas is saying he's watching it now for the third time tonight. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. You're watching the same episode three times. It's pretty cool, all right? John says, yeah, I saw it. I liked it. What did you like most? Uh, Joseph Amanderas. Or I should say, Joseph Amanderas. Joseph says, uh, my question is, theoretically, if it's a brand new team, are we going through another steep learning curve? And the answer is, yeah, you are. And that is why I'm concerned about this yelling and screaming thing. Because if you're going through a whole new team with whole new voices, and I've said this before, they've got to get to know each other, Okay. I mean, so there's two ways you can go with this. You can either be the old, the John Gruden of 2003 that took the Buccaneers to the Super Bowl. That Buccaneers team did not need to be reassembled, okay? They had great players. They had like Joe Jarrett Vicious, for example. All Joe Jarrett Vicious, Joe Jarrett Vicious, biggest handicap at the time was Clyde Christensen as the offensive coordinator. And unfortunately, Tony Junji was really just getting his sea legs uh, in terms of designing offensive schemes. His defense was without parallel, the one that he constructed and got Monty Kiffin to run, uh, that he basically took from Bud Carson, because he played for Bud Carson at the Steelers and then made some, he, he created what's called the Tampa Blitz, Tampa 2 Blitz, okay? Uh, and so, and so, but by the time he got to the Colts, talking about Dungy, he was smart enough to get Tom Moore and really turned it around. Um, Donis says, love this episode. Oh, Joseph says, the first scrimmage with the Rams looked horrible. The second scrimmage is a lot better, but everything is relative. Uh, Donis uh, Daly says, love this episode tonight. Last week seemed a little chopped up and didn't flow well to me. Tonight had a great flow through, I agree with you, and uh, through the whole episode. You know, I didn't look at it from that perspective, but... Now that I think about it, you're absolutely right. It did flow really, really well. I liked how they set up the storylines and followed through with those storylines, okay? Particularly with the locals. Um, and, you know, we saw Max, see Max Crosby uh, do a uh, good, good, good hip hop, all right? And someone needs to tell Mike Mayock that Parliament Funkadelic is not rap. Parliament Funkadelic, in fact, I should write about that to him on Twitter. Hey, Mike, Parliament Funkadelic is not rap. Parliament Funkadelic is funk, okay? In fact, I think I'm going to make a, a special video for him. Say, hey, Mayock, let me tell you something about P-Funk, man. It's not rap. Because he's getting after Cross being like, oh, and he's like, and Mike is like trying to say that basically, I'm, dude, I'm blacker than you. Man. I know that, you know, it, but it was hilarious. It was hilarious television. And Joseph Remender says old school funk. Yeah, old school funk. But here, Mayock is calling it rap. I'm thinking, Parliament is not rap, dude. Uh-uh. Parliament is not rap. Parliament is funk. Straight up funk. And if you think about it, hip-hop is the new school of funk. But that's another story, okay? Um, all right. It is 24 minutes. I got a jam, folks. Got a big day tomorrow. But I will be back. And um, you have any desires for coverage or you want to say something you know call in let me know and we'll set it up i'll see you all later and thanks for watching appreciate it